Hi there, this is Juan Rivera again. In this video, I'm going to attempt to convince hillocycle builders that they need to put a ground plane underneath their VHF comm antenna so that it will function properly. Those antennas belong to a class of antenna called a monopole. A good example are AM broadcast antennas, which are just towers sticking up out of the ground straight up. That's a monopole. What you don't see is the other half of the antenna. The antenna is actually a dipole. The part that you see is half of it, monopole. The other half is the part you normally don't see, and that's the conductive surface that it's mounted on, which is called a ground plane. With these uh, aircraft antennas that we use, they're designed to mount on fixed wing aircraft with uh, aluminum skins. And the skin of the aircraft acts as that conductive surface. That's the ground plane. Theory says that that ground plane must be at least one quarter wavelength in radius. At the frequencies we're working with, a uh, quarter wavelength is 23 inches. That's the length of your antenna. It's a quarter wave monopole. So the ground plane in theory, should have a radius of 23 inches or a diameter of 46 inches, which is going to be a little difficult to deal with since the frame is only 14 inches wide in the area where the uh, antenna is going to be mounted. To further complicate things, in theory, the uh, monopole is always at uh, right angles perpendicular to the ground plane, but in our case, it's slanted uh, and so that complicates things again. So obviously we're going to have to make some compromises. Now these monopole antennas are omnidirectional. Let's look at that uh, depiction on the left. So this represents the antenna, this vertical axis sticking straight up. The antenna radiates all the way around equally in this axis at right angles to the axis of the antenna. Maximum radiation is where you see the reddest part. So at right angles is maximum radiation. As the angle deviates from a 90 degree, you get into this null area, which is turning greener and greener. You can see that down here, there's very little radiation. Now, why is that important? Because if we go over to this one on the right, later I'm going to show you a picture of my helicycle in forward cruise flight. The antenna orientation is as you see here. Now, when you're transmitting, you're typically trying to talk to somebody uh, on the horizon, not up in space and not down below you. You can see the transmissions in this axis are inside this area of very low radiation. So this antenna, oriented as it is, mounted on the bottom of the frame in forward flight with the nose tipped down, you're in this area, you're transmitting very little energy in, in the horizontal direction. So more about that as we go. Just try and remember that uh, that mounting angle for these antennas is suboptimal to say the least. So the way we determine the effectiveness of the antenna, we're not, we're not considering its uh, radiation pattern at the moment, just how efficient is it at actually transmitting the energy that it receives down the transmission line. We look at two things, forward power and reflected power. There's actually two waves traveling inside that coax. The forward power is going from the transmitter down the coax, the transmission line, to the antenna where it's being radiated out into space. But because nothing is perfect and no antenna is 100% efficient, some amount of that power 
isn't being radiated into space. It's being reflected back up the coax in the opposite direction. So that wave going the other way is called reflected power. And that power is, is of no use. It does not uh, contribute to the strength of your signal. It's lost. It never gets radiated. But if it's high enough, it can actually damage the transmitter because it gets converted to heat. And you don't want excess heat inside your transmitter. And with high, uh, high power stations, you can actually blow the transmitter up, fry the coaxial cable, and destroy the antenna if the VSWR gets too high. What is VSWR, you ask? I'm glad you asked. VSWR, also uh, referred to as VISWAR, stands for Voltage Standing Wave Ratio. It's the term we use when discussing antenna efficiency, and it's simply the ratio of forward to reverse power, or reflected power. All manufacturers of antennas and transmitters or transceivers will have a spec for the maximum VSWR that their equipment can tolerate. In the case of Garmin and Comant, the antenna manufacturer that I prefer, they both have a max VSWR rating of 2.5 to 1. In terms of power, that means for a 10 watt transmitter, for this equipment to work properly, the reflected power can be no more than 1.85 watts. The less reflected, the better. So in the next slide I'm going to show you is a little video where I show you how I actually measure forward and reflected power. So here we go. This is a bird model 43 watt meter. These slugs come in all different varieties. This one is a 10 watt, you see up at the top there. And the frequency range is 100 to 250 megahertz. This is such an old slug that it says MC for megacycles. We haven't used that term in many, many decades, but it still works just fine. So all we have to do is point this in the direction that we want to measure power. Now the way I've got this set up, this coaxial cable here is going to the transmitter and this one over here is going to the antenna. So with the arrow pointed that way, I'm measuring forward power. And I'm going to transmit on 126 megahertz, more or less in the middle of the band. The scale we're using, since this is a 10 watt element, is this bottom scale down here. So 10 watts is full scale. Okay, so here we go. See that? That's at least 12 watts. Now, let's measure reflected power. And I will zoom in here so you can see. Okay, here we go. Look at that. You see this first little notch there that's sticking out that's one watt here's two watts over here that's one watt each one of these little guys is a tenth no that's two tenths of a watt so i've got two tenths reflected and at least 12 watts forward power that's what you want to see Okay, so that is a very, very happy antenna. So using that bird through line watt meter with that bug and sampling the forward and reflected power at one megahertz intervals from 118 to 135 megahertz, and that's this scale down here. There's 118. Here's 135 over here. So this is uh, x-axis is frequency. The y-axis is visoir from 1.0 to 1 up to 5.5 to 1. The two traces I've got here, this 
is a test that I did using a comment antenna screwed to the plate on the bottom side of the frame, the one that comes with your stock helicycle, with no ground plane. This one is a slightly different antenna with a ground plane mounted on the top side of the ship. And I'll explain why I did that as we go. This red line here represents that uh, 2.5 to 1 visoire limit set by Comment and by Garmin. Garmin. So, to put this in perspective, this is a train wreck. The reflected power here for 10 watts of forward power, 4.7 watts were being reflected back up the coax. So basically half the power was lost as heat. And that four and a half watts, that can do some damage because that's now bouncing around going back into the, to the transmitter as heat. That's very bad. So not only are you putting out a lousy signal, but you're, you're uh, stressing the transmitter. This guy, by contrast, this same area, this is two tenths of a watt reflected, 12 watts output. Huge difference. Look how far this is from the limit up here. So that's the difference between an antenna that's a train wreck and one that is very, very uh, efficient and working well. So here we have my helicycle in forward flight. Now remember back to the pattern that I showed you? Here's my antenna. I had that pattern lined up along this same axis. So remember energy being transmitted in this plane with the antenna tilted here, you're in that green area in the, gra in the uh, plot where very little energy is being transmitted. This is more or less a null. Most of the energy is in this axis. It's right angles to the antenna. So most of the energy is going up here into space or down here into the ground. Not a whole lot going this way. So let's assume that you're trying to contact a tower. You're headed in and you want to get permission to enter the area. Presumably you're flying uh, towards the, to the, uh, the airport and not flying backwards. That means your transmission path with what little's left after you've wasted half of it as reflected power and you've nulled out most of the rest of it whatever few hundred milliwatts are left going in this plane are now trying to get through several hundred pounds of engine transmission and battery. This is the transmission path horizontally up ahead of the aircraft. That's atrocious. Now if you flip everything upside down, put a ground plane up here, your antenna would mount in the same area, but it would be at right angles if you just flip it around. More or less, a slight difference. You have to take into account the different angle here. But it is more or less in this plane, which is a lot closer to vertical, which is what you want. And so now we're out of that null area and into the red area on that uh, pattern. We're putting out a lot more power on this axis. And look at the transmission path. There's no obstructions. So that is why I moved uh, from the bottom to the top. That's the main reason. So here's the actual installation on the customer ship uh, that I did the testing on. That good looking pattern our uh, frequency response curve came from this installation. What we're looking at is a 303 stainless steel welded mesh with a cell size of one and a half by one and a half inches. Now, theory says that you don't have to have a sheet of metal for your ground plane. It can be a grid like this as long as the mesh size is less than a tenth of a wavelength. And uh, one and a half inches is way less. 
remember 23 inches is a quarter wavelength so you can do the arithmetic and figure out what a tenth would be it's more like six inches so this is well under that so as far as the antenna is concerned this is a solid sheet of uh, of metal when in fact it's uh, it's mesh which is going to be low drag for the rotor wash going down through it so initially I simply took the same dimensions of the ground plane that I'd successfully used on the bottom replicated it on the top and so it went from side to side and extended back to about here and I was surprised to see that it did not work well at all with this antenna I have a few ideas why that would be but nothing definite uh, the antennas are slightly different the one that I screwed onto the plate on the bottom was a standard VHF com antenna whereas this one on the top is a very sophisticated dual antenna it's a GPS receive and VHF com all in the same physical antenna and that's an engineering challenge because the 10 or 12 watt transmit signal is something like a hundred million times or a billion times as strong as a very very weak GPS signal uh, received from the satellites so for that GPS receiver to not get uh, clobbered by that big strong transmit signal there has to be some very very sophisticated engineering going on inside this antenna also the GPS antenna has an active preamp in the base and that's going to be very sensitive and so I don't want the reflected power to be floating around in there and possibly causing damage to that uh, expensive uh, preamp inside that antenna so for whatever reason getting back to the main uh, topic the ground plane size and shape that worked on the bottom didn't work on the top and through testing I discovered that I needed to add more material further back and just extending it out inside the frame didn't work I could go back as far as I wanted it did not help it had to extend out either side of the ship as you see here so this part and this part down here extend out past the frame it looks a little funky but that's what was required to make this antenna system work so this mesh is all welded together this is all one contiguous hunk of uh, 303 stainless there's a 60 thousandth sheet of stainless here that's welded to the mesh the antenna then is screwed down to that sheet so it's bonded to the sheet the sheet is welded to the mesh this section is welded to that section so it's all one contiguous hunk the base of this is bonded to this part the whole assembly is secured with eight Adele clamps one two three four and four on the other side the Adele clamps have rubber inserts inside them so all of that part is actually floating it is not bonded to the frame through the adult Adele clamps however these two areas here and here are two stainless steel shaft collars and those are welded to the uh, ground plane mesh and clamped to this half inch stiffener that's part of the frame and the areas underneath the clamps I've removed the paint so we have a metal to metal bond here and here so the antenna base is bonded to this sheet the sheet is welded to the mesh the mesh is welded to the clamps the clamps are bolted to the frame so the whole thing is uh, electrically nice and tight and uh, we know it works because you saw the pattern 
the dimensions are listed here if you want to look. Um, I think you'll be able to read them. The antenna part number for this comment dual GPS VHF com antenna is down here. I believe it's a CL2580-200. It's a very, very sophisticated antenna. And the reason I did that is uh, this guy, this builder that I'm helping, has a Garmin GTX 345 ADSB in and out transponder with uh, internal WAS compliant GPS. So uh, that system is tight as a tick. I can use the diagnostic software for the transponder and I can monitor all of the satellites coming down and their signal strength. And when I transmit on VHF com, there's no, de there's no degradation at all. The uh, GPS receiver can't even tell that I'm transmitting. It's just perfect. It couldn't get better. So the whole thing is tight as a tick. It works great. It just looks a little funny. So my last slide is a picture of the actual installation. This is what it looks like. So back here are the two little wings that stick out on either side. I'll admit they look a little funky, but uh, there was no other way around it. Here's the antenna. We're looking straight back. There's no tail fins. There's no, uh, the tail rotor's not on either. It's the uh, tail rotor drive shaft. So we're looking at the back end here. Here's the mount. Here's that sheet that it's mounted to. This is, uh, again, this is 60 thousandths 303 that's welded to the, to the uh, mesh. There's two coaxes. This thing has two ports, one for GPS, one for VHF COM. This is the left side of the ship over here. This is where the main cable bundle comes that connects to all the sensors on the engine and the transmission and all the actuators. So I ran the GPS uh, coax down this side. So we want to keep everything away from the VHF uh, transmission line. We want, to, we want to minimize interaction between that VHF uh, coax and everything else. So the GPS comes down the same side and gets tied into the same bundle as everything else going to the engine and the transmission. The VHF coax over here, which is going to have 10 watts of RF floating through it, or 12 watts when it's transmitting, is all by itself going down the opposite side as far away as humanly possible from all of the sensitive uh, sensor cables. And that's to minimize electromagnetic interference. And so that's the installation. Uh, I think this is about as thorough as I can get. Hopefully this makes sense. If you have any questions, I'm sure you know how to get hold of me. It's juan at helicycles.org. So thank you for watching, and I hope that you enjoyed this video. It's probably the last one I'm going to do on the helicycle. I've said that three or four times, but I think this is the last one.